Welcome to another episode of the Svarim Chatter Podcast. I'm Nachi Weinstein. This episode is sponsored by Reitz Press. To find this book and the rest of the Reitz Press library, visit reitzpress.org. That's R-I-E-T-S-P-R-E-S-S dot org, and you can find the link in the show's notes. This episode is also sponsored by Rabbi Shmuel Reich, ADHD coach and host of the ADHD Heroes podcast. ADHD can impact not only attention, but also memory, organization, and other skills that can affect responsibilities at home, productivity at work, studies for school or yeshiva, or even an adult's personal learning. Rabbi Reich is an experienced ADHD coach who helps adults, teens, and couples create personalized strategies for greater success at work, improve studies, and reclaim shalom bias. Rabbi Reich can be reached for one-on-one or couples coaching at R. S. Reich ADHD coach at gmail.com. That's R S R E I C H A D H D C O A C H at gmail.com. Check out Rabbi Reich's newly released podcast entitled The ADHD Heroes Podcast, in which he interviews professionals who help those with ADHD as well as those with ADHD themselves to learn valuable information, useful tips and strategies, and most importantly, inspiring stories of success around living and thriving with ADHD. The ADHD Heroes Podcast is available on all major podcast platforms. If you would like to share your ADHD story on the ADHD Heroes Podcast, you can email Rabbi Reich at ADHDheroespodcast at gmail.com, A-D-H-D-H-E-R-O-E-S-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. And the link to the podcast and the email address um, addresses will be in the show's notes below. To sponsor an episode or to support the podcast, you can email me, farmchatter at gmail.com. Uh, you can also sell that email address, and you can also find the link and information in the show's notes below. You can also subscribe to the Svarim Chatter WhatsApp community where I post new books, book deals, new Svarim, and this and the like. There's a link in the show's notes. And also, please subscribe and rate and review the podcast wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. And with that, enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Svarim Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Rabbi Daniel Feldman, who is a reshiva at the Rabbi Isaac Elkanah Theological Seminary at Yeshiva University, otherwise known as Reitz, at YU, and as well as a Rav at Arsaja in Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, he's the author of a number of books and Mechaber of a number of Svarim. And this episode of the podcast, we'll be discussing his newest book, which is titled Letter and Spirit, Evasion, Avoidance, and Workarounds in the Halachic System. He's also written uh, a number of Svarim, Bina Basvarim. He also has uh, recently, uh, not recently, but it more, a number of years ago, fairly recent, published False Facts and True Rumors, Lashon Hara in Contemporary Culture, and a number of other books as well. So thank you, Rabbi Feldman, for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. So let's start off. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. I have the great privilege of teaching Talmudim and Yeshiva Sabin Sikolchanan and saying a uh, shir there and also teaching in the business school and also being involved in all of the svarim that come out of the Yeshiva and also being involved in the wonderful shul in Teaneck, New Jersey. So this topic that you now wrote a book on, and we'll get into, is it loopholes, and you discuss this evasion, workaround, but let's just say, broadly speaking, all those things together. How'd you come to this topic, that you're interested in it in general, and then the fact that you're going to write an entire book on this topic? It is a topic that has its own internal fascination because, first of all, there's so many misperceptions and misconceptions about these devices, for lack of a better word. It's part of a problem. There is no good word that really covers all of them. And the whole assumption that they're all part of the same category is part of the challenge. And there's so much cynicism that surrounds them. And that's particularly corrosive. And I found that I was always trying to explain why this is different than that, and what's really behind this, and what's the history of this, and especially anything that has had the endorsement of at least some Gedoli Yisrael and at least some portion of Kali Yisrael should be treated with some respect and understanding, and to be able to appreciate how it's all part of a system that Kali Yisrael benefits from and is a part of a sincere Avodah Hashem, something that I thought really needed to be addressed in some type of a comprehensive manner. And you discuss all the various topics which we'll get into. I mean, Heter Iska, Mechiras Chamed, Spruzbul, Heter Mechira, many other ones. So we'll talk about that. But I think even before we discuss the definition, I'll work a little backwards almost. What do we even mean when we say, let's call it whatever, whatever you want to call it, and we'll get to that, avoidance, a loophole, a workaround. How is it an evasion? How is it an avoid, avoid evading halacha? If it's legally permissible, if it conforms to halacha, if it's mutter, then it's not an evasion. It's just mutter. 
great question. So usually the perception is, and I probably should say at the outset that at best, because of the difficulty in definition, we're really addressing perception more than actuality. So that's the best we can hope for, that we're first trying to talk to what is perceived about these topics rather than the actuality. And then hopefully by the end, we have a, a better sense and a better perspective of how they actually develop. But the perception usually is that assuming that we can agree that the halacha is being respected, which sometimes itself is a topic of controversy, sometimes that's agreed upon, sometimes less so, and that itself has different components to it. But if we can agree that the halacha is being kept to and is being respected, so usually the biggest concern is that there is something about the spirit of the law or the intent of the Torah that is being evaded. And that, yes, okay, maybe there is a legalism here that's being adhered to, but the actual ruts and Hashem is not being complied with. And when that is the feeling, if there's any truth to that, so certainly that is something that we should feel bad about. But the question is, is that really an accurate perception? And when is that an accurate perception? So let's talk about definition. Um, you know, and the, the title, the subtitle, used evasion, avoidance, and workaround. I mean, there's also the word loophole is a word that comes to mind. You don't yeah. like these terms. You talk about the issue with the various terms, even though you're talking, you, you, as you say, it's really this whole thing is a, is a matter of perception. But what what are the issues that you have with these particular terms? And then so broadly speaking, what terms should we use, even if it's a matter of perception? Right. So loophole, the problem is it sounds like there's a mistake, there's an omission in the system when especially talking about the divine Torah, it feels very uncomfortable at best to say that there's something that the Torah just didn't notice. And it also seems to imply that those who make use of these devices are exploiting a mistake, some type of a omission. So that bothers me on both ends. The existence of the loophole when we're talking about the Torah, if you're talking about a man-made legal system, so then perhaps there can be loopholes there. But to say that either the Torah itself can have loopholes or to say that sincere Jews would exploit those loopholes uh, rubs me the wrong way. And some of the other terms, say a legal fiction, which is often used, but it depends uh, how you mean it, but just the word fiction also seems to imply that there's something false, and again, seems to make a judgment about both the user and about the topic itself. Then we switch to Hebrew, it doesn't get any easier, because... Again, first, even if we're assuming that everything falls into the same category, so the word that is most often used is the word harama. Uh, harama is a super challenge to try to translate, whether to go back to the Chumash and the different forms of the word, or to go back to Chazal and the many times that the Gemara uses the word and the Bavli and the Yushalmi, whether they're using the word the same way, whether it's always used the same way in each one of the systems. But just to, for example, focus on Mechiris Hametz, which is maybe one of the most prominent examples. So you have, in relation to that word harama, which you haven't even tried to translate yet, but there are at least four different attitudes towards the relationship between Mechiris Hametz and harama. Uh, there are those who hold that Mechiris Hametz is not a harama at all. Those who hold that Mechiris Hametz is a harama, and that's a bad thing. But there are two different bad things it could be because the definition is still up for grabs. It could either mean that it is a evasion, it's a way of getting out of whatever the intent of the Torah really was, or it could mean that it's a, a falsehood, that it's a sham, that it wouldn't necessarily be so terrible in terms of what the Torah's intent, it's just that it's not sincere. Or it could be that it's a harama, but that's neutral, it's not necessarily bad. It is something that is a different path and therefore maybe a workaround in the most neutral sense, but not necessarily something that carries any stigma to it. So you have at least just to focus on that one example, at least four different possibilities with that word harama before trying to translate it. Yeah. And then we get to the just overall of the whole topic. There's, you know, as you say, harama, that's, that's referred to in Hebrew and there's derisa versus derabanan, whether something is, is, What's the difference and the distinction that we see in halakhic sources there? So that was a conversation that was really started by the Bukhor Shor in the 1700s. For Alexander Shor who was a great mechaber and tamar chacham and was very respected. And he took a position which itself is often, I think, quoted a little bit out of context. So even to try to reference that, I'll have to 
refer more to its perception than its sexuality. But the way he's quoted is saying, this is not 100% accurate in terms of what he really said, but he's quoted as saying that Mechir Eschametz is a harama, and haramas are only okay, that's itself a little bit vague, what do you mean by okay, only acceptable or only work by rabbinic law and not by Torah law. And that's okay for us because our chametz is only subject to a rabbinic prohibition because we do bittel. So our bittel knocks chametz down to a drabanan, so that's all right. But in general, haramos are only acceptable by rabbinic law. So this was a major issue that's been debated over the past 200 years. Was the Bechor Shor right on any of those points? There are some who accept him on all three of those points, some who reject him on all three of those points, and many who accept some kind of a mix and match of those positions, whether or not they are aware that he said this but or said part of it. But the essence of it has been accepted to partial degrees to complete degrees, depending on how it plays out. So the idea that there's some kind of limitation to Dinam Darabanan has been extensively debated, whether that's true or not. The idea that Mechir Eschametz should be perceived this way, that was a big part of the battle over Mechir Eschametz that got started by this, even though he really wasn't even focusing on Mechir Eschametz. That's a part of how it got taken out of context a little bit, because he was talking really about selling animals over Pesach and feeding them chametz, which is what really bothered him much more. And it could be that he was okay with Mechir Eschametz, as others point out, but it kind of morphed into being an objection to Mechir Eschametz overall. So that took on a life of its own. And the Chassam Sofer became one of the major Bali Plukta of the Bechor Shor and also the Nesivis, Bechor Chaim. And the whole issue about whether there's a limitation or not, whether Mechir Eschametz should be perceived like that, each part of it took on its own existence and has been disputed for at least 200 years since then. And that continues on to prohibition versus versus an obligation. Is it a say or a say? Is it something that we should be doing or not doing? And there's a distinction there as well when it comes to harama or workaround, whatever word we're using here. Right. So that's something that Rav Shechter expresses in his Sefer in Bikvei Hatzon. Uh, Rav Asher Weiss has a tshuva where he talks about this also, and it's been chasasher. And it's based on the idea, similar to a point that the Maral makes in his Gorarie when he talks about the Avos, that the notion that the Avos did the mitzvos on their own accord before it was commanded, that they did specifically positive mitzvos, not necessarily abstaining from losases. And the assumption being that positive mitzvos have some inherent value, so even if you're not commanded to do them, it's still worth taking them on. While Losa says, if they're not relevant to you, then they're not relevant. So if you could work things out so that a Losa say doesn't apply to you, so then all right, doesn't matter, so then you're off the hook. But if you have a mitzvah sase, even if you could technically exempt yourself from it, it means you're missing out on some opportunity to fulfill a Ratzon Hashem. So then there's something that you're missing out. And theoretically, both of these points, this point about distinguishing between Dereises and Drabanans we mentioned before, even though it's not the way the Bechor Shor expressed it at all, and the second point about distinguishing between Asseis and Los Asseis could both be connected to the larger issue of the spirit of the law that you asked about before, that the assumption seems to be that if we're evading the intent of the Torah, then there's more to be concerned about. So that getting out of a mitzvah sase, even if you're technically exempt, you're avoiding the Ratzon Hashem by doing that. And that may be also, even though again, it's not the Halab Horshwar said it, but to give it a life of its own, that if we're more worried about Dinim Daraisa than we are about Dinim Darabanan, that maybe because Dinim Daraisa reflect the Ratzon Hashem, and that Dinim Darabanan, if you take the position attributed to the Nasibists and others, that it's more about a safeguard and more about compliance with the law, so it could be that Dinim Darabanan don't really have a spirit of the law beyond their compliance, and therefore maybe there again that distinction is expressing itself. <clears throat> And this really, and this really is, brings us to evasion versus avoidance, as discussed, and the taxes model. This is something that, I mean, the analogy, the most, the one that comes to mind is really the IRS and taxes and paying taxes and finding loopholes or workarounds in the tax code and the ta- in, in the uh, paying taxes. And you quote in the book, uh, former uh, judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals, the Second Circuit, Judge Lauren Tan, and being being a lawyer, this is he's someone in law school that comes up a lot. His uh, quotes, and he wrote that any anyone may may so arrange his affairs that his taxes shall be as low as possible, 
He is not bound to choose that, that pattern which will best pay the treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. And he also wrote later on, over and over again, courts have said that there is nothing sinister in so arranging affairs as to keep taxes as low as possible. Everyone does it, rich and poor, do and all do right. But nobody owes any public duty to pay more than the law demands. So when we come to halacha, do we take that same position that there's no re- there's no issue. This is motor. You know, again, this gets back to what we were saying before. Is it our own work around whatever? But is it? But there's no reason not. There's no reason why we can't do this. Whatever that is, Heatherska or whatever the thing is, or no, not necessarily the case. Depending on press, depending on depending on the situation that we're referring to. Yeah, I think it needs to be examined in each case because since we assume that the spirit of halacha is a part of the letter of the law, it's a position that comes out from many places, especially the Ramban, who comments in a number of places in his Teir Shalat Torah, Vasisa Yashar Hatov, which happened to be the title of my first book, and the idea of Shabbaton in the context of Shabbos and Yantif, and uh, also the more well-known idea of Kedosh and Tiyu. In each case, he points out that really the spirit of the Torah is part of the halacha, and some of the Bali Muster point out that creates a obligation to learn Tameh HaMitzvos to the best of our ability, because Tameh HaMitzvos are their own obligating factors. So if that's true, it may be that within halacha, it's not necessarily necessarily always so obvious that if we comply with the details, then we're off the hook. But each mitzvah and each din presumably has its own package of considerations. And it may be true, it may not be true. You also quote, uh, you bring a quote attributed to Justice Brandeis of the Supreme Court, whether it's him or not. And this also is illustrative where he says, or reportedly said, I lived in Alexandria, Virginia. Part of the promise he didn't live there. But anyways, yes. near the Supreme Court chambers is a toll bridge across the Potomac. When in a rush, I pay the toll and get home early. However, I usually drive outside the downtown section of the city and cross. He crosses the river on a free bridge. The bridge was placed outside the downtown Washington, D.C. area to serve a useful social service, getting drivers to drive an extra mile to help alleviate congestion during rush hour. If I went over the toll bridge and through the barrier without paying the toll, I would be committing tax evasion. However, if I drive the extra mile outside the city of Washington and take the free bridge, I am using a legitimate, logical, and suitable method of tax, tax avoidance, and I am performing a useful social service by doing so. For my tax evasion, I should be punished. For my tax avoidance, I should be commended. The tragedy in life is that so few people know that the free bridge even exists. This brings to mind, my grandfather always uh, talks about the Brooklyn Bridge, same type of uh, issue. Right. But uh, it's, it's, it's a schlep, though, to get there to, to right. the taxes. But, I mean, this is really, whether or not it's actually him that quote, it's, this is the analogy a lot to what we're discussing. Right. And so sometimes the system allows for different possibilities, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And maybe that correlates to something which is inherent in how it's playing out, and that doesn't necessarily indicate anything negative. So each example has to be looked at for its own rules and its own circumstances and understood why it sometimes gets a different kind of reaction. Yeah, so I'll mention the book, which there'll be a link in the show so notes anyone interested in can purchase. So as you say in the beginning, you're not discussing Ariv, which you don't go into, but you discuss um, Heter Iska, Valor sale mechanisms, we'll get into sale of Chametz, Shemitah, Heter Mechira, Prusbul, um, Inheritance, Civil Inheritance, Siyumim, when you make a Siyum, like in the nine days or something to get around, uh, or, or uh, by Atanas Bukharis, uh, Aguna and a prenup. Um, and some other things. So there are various cases that you go through. We'll talk a little bit here. We're obviously not going to discuss them as in-depth as the book covers, but we'll mention them. And I think something that you, that's worth discussing here, though, is that you discuss them again, you have a formula, a four-part formula for assessing each situation. And if you want to just talk a little bit, even if you're not going to elaborate as much as the book, if you want to at least give the short version of that. Sure. So the first part really itself has two parts. That is the letter of the law, because if it doesn't fly based on halachic requirements, so it's not going to be something that's really going to get off the ground. So the first question is, is it halachically acceptable? And that sometimes can be a matter of dispute. Less often is it a matter of dispute. Usually we're talking about something that may be halachically accepted, but may still be subject to other problems. But that itself can ask from two directions. One is, does it accomplish what it needs to accomplish? And the second part of it is it mutter. So just to give one example, the Hatamahira, which happens to be particularly controversial among all the other examples, is a little bit because you could ask the question from both directions. You could ask, so first of all, does selling land in Israel actually accomplish that goal of removing it from the mitzvot of Shemitah? So that's part of the halacha question. And the second part of the halacha question, which may be 
created greater controversy in this case was the issue of is it mutter to do it? That even if it works, maybe many of the objection was that it's just simply prohibited to sell land in Eretz Israel. So two parts of the halachic question, does it work? And if it works, maybe their other halachic objections don't even allow it to be utilized. And that's step one. So the letter of the law is the halacha okay with it, just as far as complying with it. And your previous question of if the halacha is okay, then why are we bother about anything else? So first, is that even the case? So that's that's step one. And sometimes there's greater agreement about that. And sometimes there are aspects of that that are subject to the question. And that plays heavily into how much of a controversy there is. And the second part, and the third part also to a certain extent, really goes to the spirit of law. So the question of how much is there a compliance with what we perceive to be the spirit of the law, and as we mentioned a minute ago, many understand that we have both an obligation to comply with the spirit of the law and to try to the best of our ability to figure out what that is. It's speculative by its very nature because usually the Torah doesn't spell out the spirit of the law. It's usually something either we try to intuit or the Rishonim often spend a lot of time on it, the Rambam and Mar Nebuchim and the Sefer Echinuch and others who pay attention to trying to figure it out. It's often speculative, but maybe that's still a part of our avoda to try to figure out to the best of our ability what is the spirit of the law and to try to comply with that. And the third part, which is also related to the spirit of the law, is very often when we're doing these things, we're representing that something is happening, that our chametz is being sold, that land in Israel is being sold, that the loan is now being converted to an investment in the case of Hatariska. So the question is, is that actually happening? Or is that to use the tax terminology, is it a, a sham transaction or is it somehow not really true? So that's a, a third question, which often has its own life to it. You know, they tell a joke that the rabbis are going to prohibit smoking, but the Orthodox Jews aren't worried because they'll sell their lungs to a non-Jew. So for the record, that doesn't work, just to be clear. But the question of why it doesn't work so that has problems both in terms of the second question and the third question, because in terms of the second question, so it just doesn't help the spirit of the law. If the issue is that smoking isn't healthy, it's not going to get any healthier if you saw your lungs to a non-Jew. So the intent of the halacha is not going to be addressed at all. But also in terms of this third question, if you claim that you're selling your lungs to a non-Jew, what, what, what does that mean? What do the words mean? You're walking around with your lungs inside of you for the rest of your life. You're breathing through these lungs. So in what sense is that true? So that's also often a question that you claim to be selling something, to be transferring something, to be converting to a investment rather than a loan. So is that really happening or is that a sham? And that often becomes a big part of the issue also. And then the fourth factor, which can play a very big role, is just the question of need. How important is this? How necessary is this? And that can do a lot to clean up the mess if the first three are not very strong. And if the first three are strong, then it's less of a focus. So all of these four parts play a role together and are assessed together and can predict in terms of the reaction we're going to get, whether something is going to be well-received or rejected or controversial or somewhere in the middle or depend very much on the details. It has to do a lot with how all these four parts come together. So usually the first three are hard to get a perfect score on. So there's going to be some elements of need. And the question is, how great is the need? And need could be many different types of need. It could be halachic needs, such as selling uh, the mother of a bechor, the animal of a bechor, that's not going to have any good halachic approach nowadays. So we have to find some way to deal with it. So that's a halachic need, or sometimes it's an economic need or a spiritual need or some other kind of need. But one way or another, need is going to play a big role in assessing how the reaction will play out for all of these different devices. So you mentioned, mentioned Heter Bechira, which is an interesting one because that brings up the question of some of these are accepted. Everyone does Mechiras Chametz, I think. And, uh, you know, Siyam Batanis Mechiras today is very accepted. We can talk about how it wasn't so much necessarily in the past, but that is now, Hetariska. I mean, again, some of these are more accepted than others as we go through the list. Why is that the case? 
So Hetzel Mechira, it is fascinating. You're probably correct that it's the most controversial out of all of these. And to, just to address it, I first have to mention, I'm not trying to disparage it. It's something that was endorsed by great Gedoli Yisrael, including Revis Kohanans. Certainly don't want to call into question any of the credentials of many of the great endorsers of the Hetzel Mechira, but just in order to help clarify how it plays out in terms of this algorithm, in terms of this formula that we're mentioning. So it is something that can be understood based on looking at this formula. So first of all, in terms of step one, in terms of the letter of the law, so there were great challenges on both fronts, that especially the question of, the question of whether it works, whether it actually removes the prohibitions of Shemitah on the land if it's sold, itself was hotly debated. There are many who felt yes, many who did not necessarily think so, and many who felt that it ties in strongly to the presumption that Shemitah nowadays is Drabanan, which many agreed with, but many also had some objection to. And many felt that there's a big difference before the state and after the state, that once there is Jewish sovereignty over the entire land, that may make a big difference. So that part was itself topic of tremendous debate. But then also, as alluded to before, the second part of the halachic question was even more controversial because the idea that you could sell land in Israel, even if that would effectively address the questions of Shemitah, maybe that should be itself prohibited. And the Nitziv, for example, was among many who felt that that was the bigger issue. And he said that if you do agree that he didn't necessarily agree himself, but if you do agree that Shemitah is only the Rabbanan, so then it's a bigger problem to sell the land to avoid the smaller problem of Shemitah. He said it's like running away from a lion to encounter a wolf, or the other way around, I always forget which animal is more dangerous, but it's running away from a smaller problem to go to a bigger problem. So they objected on that front. So in terms of the first part of the formula, there's a lot that comes out there. And in terms of the second and third part of the formula, so then there's a tremendous amount, because certainly in terms of the spirit of the law, so it's instructive to compare it to Mechiris Hametz, where I think there's a very big difference, because there... When it comes to Mechiras Chametz, the Torah says not to own Chametz on Pesach. And selling the Chametz and getting it back after Pesach is a different way of not owning Chametz on Pesach. Is it adequate? That's a big debate, perhaps. But it's not the opposite of what the Torah says. It's a different way. In the case of Shemitah, the Torah says not to work the land during Shemitah. And the land is being sold so that it can be worked. That's the opposite of what the Torah says. Now, there may be very good reasons for it. But that, as far as the letter of the law, is something that is very much at issue. And then the whole prohibition of Los Sechanim, which was invoked in terms of there being an issue of selling it in the first place, what was the spirit and intent of that? And could that itself argue in a different direction? It was a major part of the debate. But then that last factor, the question of need, became very much determinant. So how much does need play a role? And was need greater in the late 1800s when it was just people living there in communities that didn't have any infrastructure? Or is need greater now because there is a whole country that does depend on it? Or is need less now because there is a startup nation that has its own its own systems to it. So the argument goes in both directions, kind of like a perpetual motion machine from Machlokas, because every seven years it gets renewed with a whole new vigor and a whole new force. And each side of the Machlokas says, okay, seven years ago you didn't agree with me, but now for sure you agree with me because all the factors that changed all make me more right than I was then. And each side says that. So the argument gets more and more intense each time. You know, I don't want to make it sound like that there's no controversy in any of the other ones. And as you discuss yeah. at length, Bechir uh, Chametz is something you discuss at length. And, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning, you called Maeser Rav, the Vilna Goyen had opposition if it wasn't sold permanently. And obviously there are, there's the famous, you know, kind of issue with it that it seems like a game. It's a fake. It's a sham. It's just, yeah, it's sold, whatever. It doesn't do anything about it. Uh, it just stays in your residence. Don't take possession of it. There's a Truma Sedeshen. There's a Bach. There's other words. And, and you do quote this. And there's been issues over the centuries. But it's something that today really has kind of disappeared. Today it's kind of accepted, I would think. Uh, and you could speak to this as a rub. It's really accepted. Um, as opposed to what you were saying, Hatur Mechira really is still, every seven years, this raging debate. Um, it's like right and left, yes or no. That's one that's still extremely controversial as opposed to the others. And then there's those that like change over time. I mean, see, human is the type of thing that it's like, Tanis Bukharis, you could speak to. Today, it's extremely accepted, our Pesach, to make a see him. On the other hand, nine days, it is accepted to eat flesh eggs. But on the other hand, and maybe this is just a spirit thing where you're supposed to be mourning the base of Megdash and everyone's just trying to eat a big steak and you're trying to see how you can eat steak. And it's something that like 
you know, do you eat that kind of meat like every night of the week during the year? Like now suddenly in the nine days, it's like, oh my goodness, I need to eat flesh eggs. Is that why, you know, you always hear the, the, the Rashiva, the Rebbe, the Mashkiach, or the Rav, oh, well, don't have a CM, don't have a CM. Is that really in opposition to it? Or is that more like, what are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish here during the nine days? So to try to address those one by one. So in terms of, Let's say they had to mechira. So I also want to emphasize again that the controversy is intense for all those reasons that we tried to lay out. But again, to try to give proper acknowledgement to the fact that there were gedolei Israel on both sides, and that there is a tremendous shared value system that's expressed on both sides. And sometimes when we talk about shmita bezman hazeh, so it's common to end the discussion by saying we should soon be zochet to the time when shmita is daraisa and all of its halachas should be fulfilled kitikunam. So it's sometimes added that perhaps that time will come sooner based on how we talk about it, to have proper acknowledgement of the fact that there were tremendous Gedoli Yisrael who were ultimately trying to accomplish the same thing and saw different challenges on both sides of the equation, and that should be respected and acknowledged even as we do try to explain what it is that fueled the parts of that machlokas. And when it comes to Mechir Tzchameitz, I think you're right that it is certainly widely accepted, but there are nuances. So, for example, many have the practice of not selling Chameitz Gomer or Chameitz Daraisa, but many others have a different attitude towards that. So that goes a little bit to some nuance of it. Some of it traces back to the Bechor Shor that we mentioned before, whether or not there's awareness of the Bechor Shor. But some some of it traces back to that. And uh, we tried to present there also a little bit of a perspective on why maybe Mechiris Hamates, to the extent that it's been embraced, could be embraced because it could connect to the spirit of the law as well. That if the goal is, like the Ran says, to keep us away from eating chametz on Pesach, so then maybe fully transferring the chametz legally so that the title belongs to someone else in every halachic sense of the word, so that it's gezel to take it. So then if we're respectful of both the integrity of the sale and the prohibition of local. fact that there is a still there that may have to do with the fact that there is a constant attention to it and that Rabbanim have always looked to refine it and to find ways to sharpen the details and to strengthen the integrity of the sale and to answer questions that come up. And it is a constantly evolving process. Even at the Yom Hazeh, there are new suggestions that are being made to reinforce the integrity of the sale and to make sure that it's even more genuine and to create different types of tikkunim to the process. And that also, I think, plays a role. And when it comes to the siyumim, it is a fascinating thing that Nowadays, as I think you noted, so Erev Pesach siyumim are completely accepted. Probably every shul has at least one siyum on Erev Pesach, if not multiple siyumim on Erev Pesach, and nobody objects at all. There are even some achronim who say that the practice in Erev Pesach has morphed from being fasting to making a siyum. And therefore, for example, an avel who can't go to a siyum is simply putter because he's not able to do the mitzvah of the siyum rather than the mitzvah of fasting, which is a fascinating take. That's a little bit of an outlier, but there are achonim who say that. So there, it's quite fascinating because if you go back not so long ago, 200 years or so to the time of the Node Behuda and the Chassam Sofer, it was much more controversial. There was much more objection to having a siyum on Arab Pesach or getting out of it at all. Even for a bris, there was a discussion whether you could even eat for a bris, and there was a lot of literature about that. And when it came to the siyum during the nine days, so the Ramah really mentions that in the same breath, that the Ramah says that the Ashkenazim have a practice not to eat meat or drink wine during the nine days, unless there is this mitzvah like a siyum. So the idea that there was anything problematic about it really came about later, and it probably has to do with a lot of what surrounds it, and the idea that it is perceived as a way to escape the Chorban and maybe comes with a lot of Pesach Adas, perhaps, from what's going on, is perhaps a lot of what is perceived in terms of some of the objection. And in Hasidic circles, it gets a little bit of a different 
welcome. And the Law of Sherebi wrote a lot about Siyumim even without meat and wine, but in Hasidic circles, there's a lot of emphasis on the power of the Siyum specifically during the nine days. And I tried to present there about without, and this is a part of the attitude overall, not necessarily trying to encourage one Dabka to do this or not, but if one does, to just to appreciate what could be behind it, that the idea is that a Siyum during the nine days with the right mentality could be a embracing of Torah and celebrating Torah and Achdus, which Chazal tell us was the problem that led us to the Chorban in the first place, the Sines Chinam and the lack of appreciation, al Terasi. So to endorse these is a statement of what we're trying to fix during the nine days, theoretically, if one comes with that perspective. But also the fact that avoiding meat and wine isn't necessarily an expression of Avelis. It's not something that takes place during Shiva, but it sounds like from the Gemara and Baba Basra, it'll be the Afyomi coming up very soon, that there was a suggestion to avoid all meat and wine after the Chorban because we're not going to be able to bring Karbanos or do Nisa Chayayin on the Mizbech, so maybe we shouldn't have it in our personal lives either. And then the Gemara says that suggestion was rejected because it would lead to the conclusion we shouldn't have fruit or water either. So they didn't accept that. But it seems like during the nine days, the minig is to take that attitude a little bit. So perhaps the embracing of a siyam by those who have is a way of saying that, okay, here's an opportunity to have meat and wine specifically in the context of mitzvah, of celebrating Torah. And Halavai, we should be able to go back to having it in the context of mitzvah, in the context of the Beis HaMikdash. So it's not necessarily a escaping of the mentality of the nine days, but it's a reminder of what we're looking to restore. Now, again, I'm not saying everyone should take on that attitude. And if one isn't into the Siyum during the nine days, that's good too. But just to appreciate perhaps where some of the differing perspectives can come from and to not have a cynical attitude towards it. Uh, the next three we'll discuss, I'll take them one by one, are, are very relevant. I mean, a lot of these are very relevant today, obviously, and they come up. Uh, but Heter Iska, that's something that is, especially in business, and whether everyone is, knows about it or is involved with it, this is something that comes up all the time, very important. So, And obviously, we're not going to go into a whole shiur on Heter Iska. That can be many shiurim, a whole series on Heter Iska. But if you want to just talk briefly about Heter Iska and what you discuss in the book um, as it comes to Heter Iska. So Hatariska is a good example of something which does seem to have very wide acceptance with Manhaza. Some controversy as to what was what qualifies for Hatariska, and that controversy goes back about 200 years in terms of a lot of debate back and forth as to what it can be used for. But the existence of the Hatariska nowadays is pretty much pretty widely accepted, even though it has a history of some controversy. And you go back to the early literature, there was a feeling that it should be limited only to Ribis Rabbanan, or that it wasn't something that really fit the spirit of the prohibition, but to the extent that it does seem to be very widely accepted today. So I tried to lay out there that I think that has to do with the assumption that the Torah's prohibition of ribis is really focused on the chesed of lending money and not interfering with that in a number of different ways in which that could be relevant. And so when there is a chesed loan, when somebody can't pay their bills, somebody has medical expenses, can't pay the rent, the groceries, and needs money, so to push them further into debt by charging interest or anything else that could come out of the prohibition of ribis that affects the chesed. So that, for sure, is a violation of the spirit of the law. And many post game, especially Rav Moshe Weinstein and many others, were so strongly opposed to the usage of a heteriske in the context of a chesed loan, because presumably that does great damage to the spirit of the law, and maybe even, as Rav Moshe pointed out, the letter of the law. But when we're not in the context of chesed, but it's more for a business project, so then that might be a very different story. And some of the Torah Tamima talked about at length in his commentary to Chumash, that the whole rise of the capitalist economy, which required the, the ability to provide capital so that others can make profit in business, so that totally changed things. And it used to be that before that, if somebody borrowed money, so two things were probably true. The person who was borrowing money was in dire financial straits, and the one providing the money wasn't taking on any opportunity cost by doing so. But now, it, no, neither of those things is necessarily true. It could be the person borrowing money is just pursuing a business opportunity, and the one who's providing the money is taking on an opportunity cost in doing so. so so recognizing that difference makes a big impact in terms of the spirit of the law, and there are other aspects as well, but still the other law has to be addressed, so that requires shifting the nature of what's going on from a loan to an investment with profit participation, and attending to all those details becomes somewhat complicated. 
but that's also a part of the evolving process. And like Mechiris Hametz, this is also something that's been refined over the generations and has taken on different forms. And Heterisk especially has taken on many different forms and many different aspects and is getting constant attention from Boskim how to perfect it. Another thing that's very common, and especially the changes, is inheritance. And yeah. Yerusha. And this is something that well, comes up all the time, obviously. And the differences between civil inheritance and halacha, where in halacha, the daughter doesn't get, the Bukhar takes Pishnayim, takes double, and many other things. This is something that's gone away with, especially with civil inheritance. And, you know, again, speaking briefly in the book, you go much more in depth into this. And all these topics, something that there's been sfarm written on, you go to halacha, and you can go, you know, endlessly through halacha, exuge. but just in brief to discuss. Um, again, this is another one that I think has been fairly accepted with the changes as well. Yeah, Rav Dachowski, Dainer Tzvall writes that he's dealt with hundreds or thousands of these cases and no one's ever objected to a halachic will and this is used in all segments of observant Judaism and it really is a fascinating example of where there's been, at least according to testimonies such as that, a, a very broad acceptance of a different approach which seems to be on the surface completely at odds from what the Torah commands as far as inheritance is concerned. And it's a topic which many people have commented this is something that interests them greatly because of those aspects. And it seems to be that there are, first of all, careful attentions to the letter of the law in terms of the whole history of the Shtar Chatzizacher, which is discussed there, and a few other techniques that are brought into play in terms of addressing it, but also elements of the spirit of not just this law, but also the broader intentions of the Torah, where Chazal had emphasized the problem of differentiating between children and shalom bias issues, and especially if you try to connect it to the intent of this law. But it's an interesting example, because here it's more about concerns of the intent of the Torah as a whole, rather than the intent of this mitzvah specifically, but there are ways to also find it within the intent of this mitzvah that some of the Rishonim explain that part of the intent of Yerusha is a chesed of the Torah, that the Torah preserves what a person has worked for throughout his life and allows him to pass it on to his descendants and keep it within the family. But if doing so is going to create a bigger problem to his legacy by breaking his family apart and causing dissent, so then that goes against the goal even of Yerusha to a greater extent, that perhaps that's why there's been a greater receptivity to that which has allowed for distribution of assets that is going to do more to preserve the harmony and perhaps also the intent of the original owner of the assets, which may also be a big part of the intent of the mitzvah, which also finds much evidence in halachic sources. Let's discuss... Another one which is very relevant and really is a hot button topic and one that's woven under the microscope, which is Aguna, contemporary Aguna, get refusal to something goes, you know, today. Uh, and as, you know, because of social media, especially in other things, this has become a real hot button topic as well as prenup, halachic prenup agreement. And this is prenup, I think, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, I think there's something more in the modern Orthodox world, in the Shivish world, that's really been accepted um, as a, as a, you know, work around, if you will, again, whatever word we're using. Uh, and so if you want to talk about this a little. Yeah, absolutely. That's an incredibly important topic for a number of reasons. So first of all, a big part of what I wanted to illustrate in the book is this is a question that everyone's always asking because the urgency and the anguish is so apparent and so great. So sometimes this is a part of what creates a cynicism that, okay, the rabbis can handle chametz and can handle loans not being canceled to the end of Shemitah and can find ways to take interest and can find ways to handle all these other problems, but the suffering of the aguna, they can't do anything about it. They say they don't care enough about how come, what's going on there. So a big part of what I wanted to display was so all the previous chapters. It's intentionally one of the last chapters, so you should hopefully see through all the previous chapters just what the challenges are, just how the system is complicated and why it's complicated and why there are these obstacles and why it's very different than everything else that has played out beforehand and some of the efforts that have been put towards this. But also in terms of the halachic prenup, which uh, perhaps I have a bias because my rebellion have been involved in creating and advocating the prenup, uh, especially 
by Mordechai Wilk it was one of the co-authors of the prenup, together with Reb Zalman Chaim Goldberg, Zechitzak Lebracha, and Reb uh, Shechter Shlita has been a big advocate of the prenup, so I'm a, a Talmud of those who have created and advocated this prenup, and so certainly have a strong nitiyah towards it, and I'm associated with organizations that have advocated and promoted this usage, but it's I believe is consistent with the principles that we try to convey in the book, but also perhaps even more so because the prenup as it is laid out doesn't in any way evade the intent of halacha. And if anything, it strengthens the tools of halacha. And that here is one time where loopholes may be appropriate, that it plugs up loopholes, that it prevents loopholes, that really we have a marriage with a ksuba with a intent that as long as the marriage is present and on paper alive, so then the husband should be supporting his wife and that he should continue to do so until the wedding, until the marriage is formally ended. So the prenup makes sure that that happens. So if anything, it's the anti-loophole. It is plugging up loopholes. It's enforcing the intent of the Torah and making sure that the system, as was meant to be, is able to play out. So it's the opposite of a loophole, and that's something I tried to display here, that everything that the Torah originally intended, that the husband should be supporting his wife as long as they are technically married, they should be really married, and that also in the time of Chazal, when there was a system that if somebody was refusing to give a get when he's halakhically required to, then there could be a system to bring the community together and make sure that that wouldn't continue. But now we have such a decentralized Jewish community that that's impossible to happen for the most part. But this was a part of an effort to kind of bring the jurisdictions back together again. And so therefore, if anything, it's really a restoration of the intent and the functionality of the halacha and the Jewish community as it was. And therefore, to try to display that, how it's really not only something we can advocate for, but something that is the opposite of a loophole and should really be fully endorsed wholeheartedly uh, is something I tried to display through how it's placed in the order of the book, and hopefully that that comes out. Again, admitting my bias towards the perspectives of my rebellion and those who have been involved in this. Can you just explain just briefly explain to the briefly. listener what the halakhic prenup is and what is included, and also why it has gained more acceptance in certain circles than others? So... In terms of why it's gained acceptance that I tried to mention in the past few minutes, but I'll just try to emphasize there are really two parts of the prenup. One is more well-known and slightly more subject to controversy than the other, but I think the other part is actually as important and should be not controversial at all. So what's more well-known is the financial aspect, that there is a obligation that the husband commits to, to continue supporting his wife throughout the time that they're technically married, and the understanding being that presumably he's not going to want to keep doing that forever if you're not living together, and that will help move things towards a speedy conclusion so that there shouldn't continue to be this financial obligation. There is theoretically also a bilateral prenup, which bases itself on a different halachic mechanism, which would involve a penalty to or a obligation on the part of the wife. If she refuses to accept a get, it involves a little bit more of a complicated halachic basis. So just to focus on the other version, which specifically is not a penalty, and that's very much a part of the issue, that because it's not a penalty, so that should reduce a lot of the objection that there were those who felt that it should be perceived as a penalty and therefore raised issues of a coercion get based on the views of those we've shown him who felt that financial coercion also constituted coercion. But here, the hachik prenup, the RCA prenup, is structured specifically that it should not be perceived as a penalty at all, but rather the logical extension of continuing to be married. And it's based on earlier versions. You have uh, the Taurus Gittin had something very similar, the author of Nesiv Vesam Mishpat, Nesiv Ferran Gittin, and other versions also existed in the Nachla Shiva. You could find something that's similar to that. Some debate exactly how it was meant to be applied, but provides somewhat of a precedent for this. And that aspect, which has been subject to some controversy, I think can be addressed very well through those explanations and has been very effective in pushing things towards a speedier conclusion. The other aspect of it, which really shouldn't be controversial at all, is the agreement to arbitrate. And that brings all the parties together in the same 
venue, which in this context is the Basin of America, but it could be any agreed upon venue. And that, in my experience, which has been unfortunately extensive in dealing with various cases, is the cause of almost all protracted get refusal situations, that very often they're venue disputes. Very often they are about fighting over where you're going to have the issue resolved because each side believes that this will be over tomorrow when the other side just comes to the one venue in the world that's going to deal with this fairly and realizes that I'm right and then it's going to be over. So if there's a commitment beforehand to choose what the venue is, that would do a tremendous amount to resolving this issue. And Ramosha Feinstein wrote that. Ramosha Feinstein has a tshuva in which he says that he has no objection to that, that if there would be an agreement in advance to go to a certain Besden to have it all settled, that would be very effective, and that would be something that he would think would be completely permissible. So, essentially, the reason it's not being accepted, again, the question is, is it a purely halachic reason? But for a lot of these things we've seen, sometimes it's halachic, and sometimes it's more an ideological reason behind the halachic, because you can end up going both ways halachic. Is there an easy answer? Maybe there's no answer here. Yeah, I don't want to speak for others and put words in anybody else's mouth. I tried to address it a little bit in that chapter. And again, acknowledging where I'm coming from on the issue, uh, there is some debate about the nature of the financial component. And I think there's a good answer to those questions. I think that that's well established what the basis is for it. And I think that it's something that even if one wanted to tweak, and there are many efforts, I think, out there to try to adapt it in ways that will fit the needs of various communities. And God willing, that should happen soon. This is something that really needs to be addressed with great urgency. And it's something that uh, rabbinic scholars have worked on for many centuries and have paid great attention to. And it really does require certain cooperation from the community, which is also a big part of it, that the issue as it is, which causes such great anguish to all of us, is a gullus issue, has a lot to do with the decentralization of the Jewish community. And the efforts to try to address it have a lot to do with trying to bring things back into some kind of a common perspective. And to the extent that we can do that, the more hope that we have to try to address this in an effective way. So the book that uh, came out, who, who are you, who's the book aimed at? Who's it geared for? What are you, who's the intended audience? Hopefully everybody, <laughs> but uh, hopefully there, there should be a value to those who do appreciate the halachic system and are interested in the, some of the details and the nuances of these devices and systems, how they came about. And you know, certainly there are a lot of questions. I've often had a lot of questions, so to be able to learn about these topics and to pursue them was uh, interesting to me. I'd say personally, the one topic that I hadn't spoken or written about before the book was the topic of inheritance. And as I mentioned, many people have found that to be a topic of great interest to them. So hopefully it should be of interest to all of those who are looking to find out more about the details of how some of these things evolved. But also a big goal really is to combat cynicism and that kind of a corrosive attitude, which tends to do such damage to religious sincerity, to religious commitment, and to the ability of the individual to do what they need to do as Avdeh Hashem and to live the lives that they are meant to live. And the hope is that they should try to address that. And again, it's really not a book of advocacy for any of these things. If anything, maybe the prenup, the exception. But other than that, I'm not advocating that you should sell absolute chametz if you don't want to. I'm not advocating that you should go to see them during the nine days if you feel that that's not in keeping with what you think fits the spirit of the day. But that you should understand uh, where these things come from and why Gedoli Yisrael have taken the position that they have, because in every case, there are Gedoli Yisrael behind all of these approaches, even if there are those who have objected, and to appreciate that Elu Elu Elokim Chaim and that the system is a system that reflects the concern of the leadership of the Jewish people throughout for the spiritual integrity of the Jewish people, but also for the well being in every other way, and how that's been so present and so apparent if you're looking for it throughout all the generations is a source of tremendous inspiration. Now, what can you, what, what can someone practically take out of the book? Obviously, reading through halachic sugyas is something that you practically get. But is there a practical takeaway we should get from reading about 
Haroma, evasion, work around loophole. Again, whatever word we're using or not using when it comes to this, is there something just glo- broadly, globally speaking, not particular one particular topic, just in general, the whole topic is something that we can all take away. Well, that last point I would certainly stress as a fundamental that one should not have cynicism and one should have a respect for the system and for the rabbinic leadership and to appreciate how that plays out. And that does a lot for our own individual level and for our own decisions and that what we do we should believe in and that we should make the choices of our behavior based on what maximizes our own Avodah Sashem and reduces or eliminates our cynicism and that which detracts from it, and to recognize just how much has gone into it in order to make that possible and to appreciate that and to understand sometimes it's a bridge from one step to the other, as is often the case. In the case, for example, of Hatzimahira, it was overtly portrayed that way as a necessary bridge in order to get from one stage of the settlement of Eretz Yisrael to the next. But in every instance, there may be that possibility. But to recognize that within our own individual treks and our own individual journeys towards uh, perfecting our Avodah Hashem, how we can understand all of the different aspects of it and uh, respect what's gone into it and to internalize that as our own mission and our own perspective. Okay, so I'll link to the book in the show's notes. It was published by Magid, which is the Division of Koran and the YU Press together. I don't know if I mentioned that in the beginning. Uh, I'll link to it. And you, like I said, you have another book published by them also on Lashon Hara. You have a number of other Svarim. And so perhaps in the future we can uh, discuss Lashon Hara books and others. Are you working on anything now? Always working. <laughs> Um, uh, I'd like to try to come back to some of my original topics of Mitzvahs with Adam uh Some of the books are out of print. I'd like to try to bring those back into print and uh, come back to some of those topics. Maybe focus a little bit on some Gittin topics and uh, related to some other things we spoke about. And uh, I'd continue some of the other themes of the Hebrews Farm, and things like that. And uh, we'll see what gets finished. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rabbi Feldman, for joining me, and I hope listeners enjoyed it. Thank you so much.